So, welcome, welcome. The uh, premise of this workshop is that in order to get things to scale, we have to take so much synchronization out of our programs that they have bugs. And um, we have a lot of really interesting papers. And what I'm really most uh, grateful for are all of you who wrote papers because you represent more than one particular viewpoint on this subject. And so I think I'm going to learn a whole lot from hearing about the different views and what the con appropriate contexts are for each view. I'm going to start uh, quickly by thanking uh, Stefan Marr over there and Matthias uh, DeWale behind the camera, who have done a lot, a lot of work in making this happen with websites and hauling around cameras and all that stuff, all the presenters, all the authors. The program committee, which I'm not going to go through every name here, but very grateful. Uh, Teo, our co-chair, and all the other organizers, and all the folks who voted. This is uh, <clears throat> something I've always dreamed about, which was a conference or workshop where the program committee made no decisions, <laughs> because I don't actually trust the decisions the program committee makes anyway. <laughs> I've, I've never liked the decisions of program committees I've been on since they didn't, they weren't my decisions. <laughs> and so I thought, we'll let everybody vote. And lots of you did. And uh, the timetable is based on votes. We'll try to keep to that. I'm probably off already. But that respects all the folks who vote. Steve, once you were recording once more? Yep, yep. So uh, if you're online, there's where the program is. Uh, I don't know why this keeps popping out, but that's okay. We'll keep time as strictly as possible. Uh, maybe we'll try to organize a dinner tonight. We hope to do that. And uh, we're also going to be recording what's going on in the room. Uh, are there any folks here who object to being recorded? No? Uh, it's fine for me if you record me, but I'm not sure about putting me on the web. Okay. Okay. So let's um, keep that for later. Before anything goes on the web, we'll come back and check with you. Okay, great. And here's the schedule. And without, what time is it now? Is it 9.10? I'll bet it is. No, it's 9.03. 9 Good. Running, a, <coughs> running on schedule. So we ready for the lightning? This is something I've seen in UIST. I loved it. You get a 30-second preview of every talk, and uh, that lets you figure out when you want to be here and when you want to duck out. <laughs> so, <laughs> Stefan will keep time, and let me know when to switch slides. Uh, here we go. Okay, so here's a program uh, that has a data rates in it. Go, 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 go. Now, there's a data race. People will tell you that data races are evil and bad and this is a bug in your program and you should get rid of it. I'm going to tell you why they're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so he, this, this, what this is trying to say is that the, the traditional way that we've been doing computing assumes a lot of precision, okay? And the precision of the computation paradigm in the, in the data that is coming in as well as in the hardware. And because of which there is, there is a lot of inefficiencies which we cannot afford to do in the, in the coming future when we have got lots of data and which need to be processed. Okay, and so we have, uh, we have, we have uh, formulated this notion of approximate computing, and today we'll just talk about the relaxed synchronization as one small aspect okay, towards achieving this goal of approximate computing. Um, so the question is, if we're, we lax our program, how do we know that our programs are safe? How do we know they're doing the right thing? Um, so today I'm gonna talk about how we can use relational verification techniques um, to reuse the reasoning we've done about our original program, um, to transfer it over to the RELAX program and prove safety properties without reduplicating all this effort. So, so I'm one of the people who's going to tell you that databases are all evil and you shouldn't use them, uh, both because, uh, because code languages, for the most part, actually treat them as things like subscript editors that are just errors, and compilers tend to enforce that restriction, and furthermore, you can't really get any performance out of programming with databases anyway. 
Thank you. My topic will deal with the question, how Pyfer is your concurrent Pyfer cube? We will compare a semantically correct and therefore slow Pyfer cube with semantically relaxed and thereby fast Pyfer cube. And it will turn out that relaxed Pyfer cubes can actually be even more Pyfer than strict Pyfer cubes. <laughs> So you'll be talking about relativistic programming, um, and what we do is we alter the ordering requirements of the program without altering the correctness properties of the program. And as a result, we get high performance and high scalability. When you look at an algorithm, make sure you get both of those, not one or the other. And oh, by the way, it's also fairly easy to program. Okay, so I think most of the work here today is talking about software mechanisms for relaxing synchronization, whereas we're really coming at it from the perspective of hardware developers. They're supporting existing you know, legacy applications written to a weekly order memory model, while still trying to achieve the same goals, you know, enabling uh, you know, scalable performance. And the way we do that is by actually uh, allowing cores to read stale data for as long as possible while still adhering to a, a conventional weekly order memory model. Oh, so uh, imagine that we're working on a paper. Well, the four of us could either have a whole paper and pass it around one by one, which would give us uh, low latency because we could broadcast changes, but also low through, I mean, high latency, low latency, but low throughput. On the other hand, if we divide it into sections and round robin it, we get uh, high throughput, but higher latency because it'll take a longer time before someone gets around to looking at the changes someone else has made. Seems like it might be a fundamental trade-off that applies also in the way we structure our parallel programs. Wouldn't it be nice if we could reason about uh, massively parallel programs on massively parallel computers just as effortlessly as we reason about the massively parallel thing we call the real world, where uh, we design things like that. Um, listen to my talk, and maybe it won't seem like such a crazy idea after all. Hi. Uh, this afternoon, I'll talk about our new framework, Dubstep, uh, that uh, makes progress run faster by selectively removing synchronization, in particular, removing logs and relaxing barriers. So since these transformations change the accuracy of the result the program produces, I also showed a statistical testing method that can help us understand uh, the behavior of circle programs. Okay. So there's a lot of... Uh, I, this is a little unusual in that I'm uh, not the crazy guy out on the edge. There's a lot of crazy people here, which is a good thing. <laughs> uh, and that raises the question is how the heck are we going to get people to actually be able to do this? And so an example is uh, the Linux kernel community, which uh, from 2003 to 2006 greatly improved its ability to deal with parallelism. Same programming language, pretty much the same synchronization primitives, much though I'd like to claim some credit that uh, the numbers don't bear that out. Uh, same people. And these guys weren't born parallel programmers. I, can, I was working in 2000. I can assure you they were not born parallel programmers. <laughs> so what the heck did enable this change? It was real. It's uh, the quality of it up. Well, if you actually stay for the last talk, you might find out. Thank you. Great. <laughs> and uh, let's give everyone a hand.